appreciate you coming to visit our program, mm -hmm. and we're glad to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition is also really grateful to our fiscal sponsors and to our partners that we've been working with at the national level, the Drug Policy Alliance, the Harm Reduction Coalition, and AIDS United, which are three organizations that have been leading the national response to the overdose crisis and to uh, a number of drug-related crises and harms in our communities for many years. Um, and so we're really grateful to all the folks that are here in the audience and to folks who are watching on the live stream for joining us for this event. Um, I want to go ahead and just give a chance for folks to introduce themselves. So I'm Sarah Ziegenhorn. I'm the executive director and founder of the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition. And then with me, have Keenan. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Keenan Crow. Mm -hmm. I use they, them pronouns uh, in my day job. I'm the director of policy and advocacy at One Iowa, which is a statewide LGBTQ organization. We co hosted the uh, LGBTQ presidential forum actually just down the road. Sure, in yeah. September that's a great that one, you were yeah. attended. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, but I also sit on the board of the, the Harm Reduction Coalition. There's a lot of uh, um, similar policies that we're working toward, especially with uh, reducing and, and preventing transmission of HIV and uh, uh, other blood-borne pathogens, among uh, many, many other things. Uh, and so on the board, I uh, serve on the membership committee, uh, trying to make sure that we have representation from all the communities that we serve. Uh, and I also uh, work with uh, Sarah and Tiffany on um, some of our policy initiatives right. and uh, uh, volunteer uh, with the organization as well. Terrific. Yeah. So I know we're here today primarily to talk about the overdose crisis and uh, to talk about the many different policy areas uh, that that is connected mm -hmm. to. Um, so I'd love to just hear a little bit from you about what brings you here um, and why is the overdose crisis something that you're so committed to addressing in your presidency? candidacy and eventual presidency. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much um, uh, to both of y'all for hosting this, and thank you to everybody with the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition for the work that y'all are doing um, for one of the most vulnerable populations that we have out there. Uh, I'm happy to be here and to, you know, uh, both listen and learn and also sort of express my own views on how I think our nation can make sure that um, people who need the resources and the kind of services that y'all provide are able to get them. Uh, during the campaign, I've articulated a vision for the future of our country where everyone counts and where we don't leave anybody out. We don't otherize people, um, but instead we ensure that everybody has the tools that they need in the years to come uh, and the support they need to be able to live a healthy and prosperous life. And what I've seen as mayor of San Antonio, as secretary of housing and urban development, is that oftentimes we write people off, uh, people who are in the throes of, uh, uh, you know, an addiction, uh, who uh, may be uh, using opioids or uh, who are overdosing, instead of being able to get the help that they need too oftentimes they're ostracized or unable to find the resources that they need when they need it. And so what I would like to see us do in the years to come, um, both immediately and then also as we transition to a healthcare system that is actually able to meet the needs of every single person in this country, I would like to see us invest more in those resources that get directly to the people who need them without the stigma that is often associated with those services right now. Uh, and for the, the federal government to be a strong partner with state and local efforts to do that instead of a hindrance. And, you know, we know that the federal government uh, has been slow to come around, uh, not only, you know, and I think in the conversation that we're going to have today, but in another, another, a number of other areas, whether it's marijuana or other issues. And, um, you know, I wanted to come today to express my support for moving in the direction of actually providing those resources and getting through the blockages that exist in federal law right now uh, and investing in uh, the kinds of efforts that y'all are engaged in to help people. Uh, because uh, despite what we've been told over a lot of the last 40 years, for those of us who are in public service, I don't believe that help is a bad word. No. I went into public service to make sure that we could help people to achieve their dreams. And part of that is making sure that they can be healthy and get on the kind of path in life that they want. And that's what I see y'all doing. Federal law should reflect that. Thank you. Um, you
you have released a very ambitious plan to address the overdose crisis um, and one that has created a number of policy proposals that are very much in line with what people around the country have called for for years. Um, but one key part of your plan and a part of anyone's plan to address the crisis focuses on the primary prevention. So keeping people from becoming addicted or developing yeah. a chaotic relationship with drugs in the first place. Um, one thing that we have seen is that many folks have said in order to do that, we need to go after the pharmaceutical companies, we need to target uh, prescribers so that they can't give someone 100 Oxycontins and let them go out of the hospital saying there's no risk to you here. Um, but what we have also seen is that the overdose crisis is really part of a greater and a broader trend in which uh, an increase in deaths from suicide is increasing alcohol-related deaths are increasing, and other drug use-related deaths are increasing as well, such as deaths related to cocaine or methamphetamine. And what researchers have called this is really a trend um, that they use the term for, to describe as the deaths of despair. Mm. Um, and so the, the overdose crisis is located in this broader social, cultural, and economic moment um, in which the root causes are more complicated mm -hmm. than just a pharmaceutical sure. company pushing its drugs or a doctor prescribing too many pain medications. And so I'm curious, in your plan and in mm -hmm. your presidency, how would you use the power of the federal government to address those root causes and those socioeconomic drivers of substance use and mental health more broadly? Yeah, when I think that you've put your finger on, you know, maybe the most important aspect of preventing the kind of situations that you all see here on a daily basis. You know, when we put out my criminal justice reform plan, um, uh, I called it a first chance plan. The idea being that so many people in our country don't get a first chance in the first place. And we talk a lot about second chances and, you know, we outline how we can reform our criminal justice system so that people get an effective second chance in life and in many different ways. But we don't talk enough about ensuring that we're making the investments in their lives so that they get a first chance. So everything from um, better health care to better housing opportunity, better educational opportunity, um, support for families and how families look today. You know, we have three million grandparents that are raising their grandchildren as their own children. Um, we have quote unquote non-traditional families that too often times you know, we have not supported the way that we support traditional families. And so, you know, in my view, we need to connect all of these dots. Maybe the most important thing that I saw when I went from being mayor of San Antonio to being HUD secretary, housing secretary, and actually getting out to 100 different communities in 39 states is how communities are connecting these dots for people, right? And realizing that it's not just about education or about criminal justice reform or housing or job opportunities. It's about all of those things. So my goal, if I'm president, is that we've done our job so that fewer people walk in the door here in the first place. But if somebody does walk in the door, that the resources are there at that point to be able to ensure that they get treatment. Um, and you know that part, I think, starts with changing our federal laws and also getting serious about a healthcare system that can meet those needs. Um, and then also when it comes to the issue of prescriptions, I hear that. I also hear from people that we want to make sure that if somebody actually needs medication or a certain drug that they're able to get that too. Mm -hmm. And so I am mindful of not being overzealous in a way that hurts people who actually need certain medication. That's great. Um, I know that we've been talking a little bit in our walk around the block, we talked about housing and obviously um, providing housing to people is such a critical part of addressing these diseases mm -hmm. of despair. Um, in 2014, under your leadership, HUD had really published a memo um, that stated that owners of federally assisted housing facilities um, are required to deny entry to people who use controlled substances, and that included marijuana, even in states where marijuana was legal or where people had used it for a medical purpose. Um, what we do know from a growing body of research is that housing is critical to people's recovery from substance use disorders. And so um, while it may be counterintuitive to
to some, housing often is the thing that needs to come first for people to change their relationship to a substance. Um, and we know that because many of the folks who end up in our program are people who use methamphetamine because it helps them to stay awake all night so that they won't freeze to death when they're sleeping outside. Um, people who are living outdoors um, and who are subject to an increased amount of violence perhaps are using opioids to deal with the pain from that regular experience of violence. Um, and so my question is, knowing what these studies show us about the importance of establishing housing first before acquiring mm -hmm. sobriety, um, as president, would you take a different approach to housing than HUD had previously taken in 2014 when publishing that memo? Yeah, so, um, you know, that memo that was published, I think, in December of 2014, um, basically was a restatement of the federal law in place, right? And for those who uh, follow these memos, you know, these memos are the kinds of memos that are regularly put out on these subjects. Uh, I think it was also signed by like an assistant secretary, right? And so there's a signal there that, you know, we want to move in the direction of actually working to assist, working to help people who may be grappling with um, these issues. And we, in fact, did a lot of that work. Our Housing First work around ending homelessness in the United States provided, you know, emphasized housing with permanent supportive services, including for people who are grappling with, you know, substance issues. Uh, and so I absolutely want us to continue to move in that direction. I also believe, ultimately, that we need to change the law that marijuana should not be uh, illegal. We should legalize marijuana and that we should also, uh, in the least, deprioritize the enforcement of the use of other substances so that we're not, you know, we don't have this model of the war on drugs that I think is a failed model, but instead focus on getting people the treatment that they need and also other opportunity, including housing. Um, yeah, I will say, right, anytime you're in a public housing situation, you do have a concern because it's a community. And so to the extent that, you know, the, the people that manage public housing out there, housing authorities, do have to concern themselves with the entire community. So if there are instances where, you know, situations arise of, of issues between residents, that also has to be addressed. One of the things that we did when I was HUD secretary is that we said, we gave guidance to housing authorities that, for instance, just because somebody has a criminal record, that you shouldn't X them out of, of public housing, that you have to go deeper than that, but that we didn't want people to have this big X on their, mar on their record that didn't allow them to get public housing. We also have said, you know, that we don't believe in this three strikes or one strike, actually, in a lot of housing authorities, that, you know, this one strike and you're out policy doesn't make sense, that it has to be more nuanced than that. And I think that we need to continue along that path, um, both with concern for allowing people to get the, the help they need and the resources they need and to live in a safe, decent place. And also, you do have to manage that with what's going on in the community, right, um, with other residents. Uh, we can strike a good balance, I think. So our current uh, drug policies are really rooted in racist ideology and are kind of a result of uh, a number of different right. administrations' desires to um, police the bodies of people of color. Um, policing in itself, kind of as an institution, has a, a real problem uh, with with racism. Uh, you have an ambitious plan to uh, mm -hmm. reform policing. Can you describe that plan and how it relates to addressing the racial disparities that we see here in the U.S.? Yeah, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of candidates don't want to tackle this issue. Uh, but I have seen, for most of my life, very clearly with my own eyes, and, you know, in my experience as a policymaker, have clearly seen that we have a problem in this country with the use of excessive force against especially young black men, young black women, also uh, uh, native men and women, if you start looking at the statistics, and people with disabilities tend to get excessive force used on them, even lethal force at greater rates. So I've come up with a plan to try and fix that uh, that includes 
uh, ending racial profiling and policing, ending stop and frisk, which we've seen in places like New York has often been used to essentially harass uh, on a, people of color disproportionately, um, imposing a national use of force standard that would say that a police officer should only use lethal force against somebody, in, a, in other words, discharge their weapon, if there's a direct and immediate danger to that police officer or to somebody they're protecting, and they've exhausted all other reasonable alternatives under the circumstances. Uh, because I don't believe that the color of your skin or whether you live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or San Francisco, California, should determine what, you know, whether you have one standard or another. I think that a police officer should have the same standard for when they're going to discharge their weapon and potentially kill somebody, right? I would also restrict or even eliminate qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a doctrine in law that has shielded police officers that engage in excessive force from uh, being sued civilly successfully. And you know, it, the doctrine has completely gone off the rails and protected very bad behavior. We need to change that. And then finally, I would invest in community groups that are trying to mend the rift between neighborhoods and communities of color, especially that oftentimes, um, you know, have filed complaints against police officers, maybe don't have as strong a relationship with police officers and those police officers and police departments. Because what I want is that no matter who you are in the country, no matter the color of your skin, what neighborhood you're growing up in, how much money you have or don't have, when you see a police officer, you feel safer. We can't say that. Not everybody can say that right now in our country. And, but I want to make sure that Washington is a strong partner with local police departments and state governments so that everybody can feel that way. And our police officers, a lot of whom do great work um, and deserve credit for it, you know, they can make sure that they're as safe as possible and that they're able to carry out their, their duty. Yeah. Um, this policing, or this plan to change policing is very much overlaps with a plan to end the war on drugs. Um, and so you've talked about that um, quite a bit in a number of your plans. Um, I want to connect that to what we see it with the changing nature of the overdose crisis. Um, and so what we call the opioid crisis can sort of be divided into three different points. And so right now we are in the third wave of the crisis in which the first wave was really characterized by deaths related to an increase in prescription opioid use and then transitioning from that point around 2009 to 2010 into a crisis that was driven by heroin related deaths. Now in the past few years, since around 2014, 2015, we've moved into the third wave of the crisis, which is characterized by fentanyl-related deaths. And so what we have seen, um, and that is characterized really nicely in this new book called mm -hmm. Fentanyl Inc., which I'm reading and recommend very highly, um, is that uh, for folks who are producing synthetic drugs, synthetic opioids in China, um, it's relatively easy to produce a new drug. So as the federal government bans one synthetic drug, mm -hmm. you can change the molecule, perhaps add a chloride onto your synthetic fentanyl, uh, create a new analog, and then bring that into the country with relative ease until then that one becomes banned. Um, you have talked about in a number of parts of your plan about the need to take a more aggressive approach to keeping fentanyl out of the country um, to create more border security opportunities to make sure that fentanyl and these infinite number of analogs cannot come into our country. Um, but you've also called to an end to the war on drugs. So how do you equate those two things? How do you tell us more about your plan to keep fentanyl out of the country and how you rationalize it with the plan to end the war on drugs at the same time? Well, I think that, again, you, we need to strike a strong balance, right, um, to the extent that, uh, that there's a usefulness for fentanyl um, in some instances than, you know, or similar substances. You know, I, I want to make sure that, that they're available, but about three or four months ago, we had the largest bust of fentanyl in the nation's history, which was 254 pounds uh, that came through a port of entry in Arizona. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I see is a lot of smuggling through these ports of entry, right? Illegal fentanyl. And I think that that's one way, uh, that's one area where we can do a better job of, of you know, preventing that, the entry of that into the United States, that we can be more vigilant. Um, you know, and I see that still as consistent with ensuring that people have what they need um, and, you know, taking a change in direction and cracking down on the individuals, right, which has really been a large part of the war on drugs, is penalizing the individuals who end up in the grips uh, of, of usage um, and often suffer from that. You know, I, I don't believe in that approach, right? But I, I also don't believe in substances, illegal substances, coming through ports of entry that shouldn't be coming through there. So I think that we can do both of those things. So uh, in Iowa, the greatest reason that people don't seek treatment isn't that they don't have health insurance or that there aren't mm -hmm. treatment centers available or that it costs too much or any of those things. It's really the, the fear of judgment, of the stigma, or the possibility of being arrested. Um, so uh, because there really can't be an end to that stigma, or it's, it's at least going to be very difficult without actually mm -hmm. decriminalizing possession of those substances, um, it's kind of critical to, to consider that as an option. Uh, that policy is gaining very broad support from the medical community right now. Um, the uh, uh, journal The Lancet just came out with a number of folks uh, with, with positions on decrim. Uh, and given the success in other countries of uh, decriminalizing substances like cocaine and heroin, especially Portugal, for instance, um, how would you end the war on drugs without supporting additional decriminalization? Or in other words, um, would you support uh, yeah, yeah. decriminalization of those substances? Yeah. If not, what evidence is, is driving your position? Well, uh, you know, as, you, as and I think kind of as your, your question lays out, right, uh, I do think, for instance, when we compare it to marijuana right now, that we have good, good evidence that we can regulate that in a sensible way. We have evidence from Colorado and other states now that have allowed recreational use of marijuana, which I agree with. And, um, you know, so there's, there's good evidence out there. Uh, I'm open to the United States looking at other substances that we can either decriminalize or de-enforce, uh, deprioritize enforcement of. That's newer, right? I mean, yeah, the evidence sure. of that in our country is newer. And so I do think, though, that it's worth uh, taking a look at that and understanding where are those opportunities either to de decriminalize or at least de-emphasize enforcement so that we're not um, penalizing individuals who should instead be getting the treatment that they need. Uh, I believe in that model, generally. I don't believe in cracking down on people. And like I said, a lot of folks getting caught up in an in, in incarceration system that takes them off of a productive path in life and they're never able to get back on because they have that record. Uh, and so I'm very open to that, you know, but it is, you know, for those of us who are policymakers or, or you know, aspiring to be, that is newer. And, yeah, you know, sure. I, I look forward to, to understanding how we can do that, um, you know, and make sure that we can do it in the same orderly way, workable way that we've been able to do with marijuana yeah. in these states. Great. Um, despite spending more than a, a trillion dollars on this, on this drug war, yeah, yeah. Um, all we really have to show for it is, you know, the world's largest prison population. It hasn't really touched mm -hmm. addiction rates, um, and uh, it, it certainly has not touched demand for non-prescription <laughs> drugs sure. either. Um, so uh, some advocates um, that are demanding a national harm reduction strategy, and that includes access to medically assisted treatment, access to naloxone, syringe service programs, et cetera, um, uh, are looking at other policies that would end the individual and structural violence caused by that failed war on drugs. So what strategies and policies would you put in place to begin deconstructing that prison industrial complex, um, including releasing people that have nonviolent drug offenses, which make up a, a huge uh, portion of our, our yeah. uh, federal prison population, yeah. uh, and improving access to substance use disorder treatment and recovery support, and creating opportunities for people to gain a sense of purpose, community, employment uh, moving forward. So I, I support 
investing resources in the ability of people, uh, you know, to to be able to overcome uh, these issues and also to be on a productive path in life that they want to be in. And I'm a fan of, for instance, in the context of marijuana, these jurisdictions that have gone and looked at expunction, expunctions um, and even looked at people who are currently incarcerated and reviewed, uh, you know, those cases as well. You know, I don't believe that we should just be locking people up. You know, our first priority should be able to, to should be to get them the treatment that they need. So I will support resources at the local level for diversion programs. Um, that provide those resources to people who need them. And um, you know, what I want is uh, I want less people to get caught up in our criminal justice system in the first place. If they are caught up in the criminal justice system, I want them to have an effective second chance at life, uh, at, a, at a productive life, um, without the attitude that we've had in this country of just cracking down just seen this as a crime and nothing else, right. and not really seen underneath the, the, the human aspect of that. Um, you know, I'm glad that we're doing that when it comes to marijuana, but I do think that we need to look at, at other substances in the future. Great. Um, you've talked a lot about prevention and treatment and, and uh, interventions and things like that, but harm reduction is also a really key piece of the coordinated response to this crisis. Um, needle exchange programs have existed all across the U.S. for the last three decades or so, but they're still illegal in states like ours here in Iowa. So just this week, a study in Florida was released that showed that a new exchange program in Miami was responsible for dis distributing enough naloxone to reduce the number of overdoses in the city. Um, but the expansion of those needle programs is also limited because of a federal funding ban on syringes. Um, so this ban was created in eight, uh, 1989 and it bans the use of federal dollars to purchase those syringes. As president, would you commit to lifting that ban? Uh, yes, I believe that we should invest in needle exchange programs, uh, that they've shown themselves to be effective. Uh, again, I think that that needs to be part of an overall strategy to help people, you know, get onto the path in life that they want. I don't think any one piece is the answer just in and of itself, that it needs to be part of the strategy to get people the, the help that they need, right? Um, along with that strategy and those resource investments, then yes, I absolutely would, because I think we have enough evidence out there that needle exchange programs have worked. And, and I look at this through the perspective of how can we make sure that somebody is able to get the immediate help that they need to avoid worse outcomes, right? Uh, HIV or something else on top of right. what they're already dealing with. And, and we have evidence that these things work, right? So yes, I would. So thank you very much for your support of needle exchange programs. Obviously, as a harm reduction agency, so much of what we do is about meeting people um, in a moment where their substance use is already progressed to a place where they're using syringes. And so we know the value of harm reduction. How do you imagine working with the federal government to um, create expansion of harm reduction programs around the country, especially recognizing that harm reduction programs have been so limited in nature and really focused um, only in cities and have not been implemented broadly out into sure. especially rural states like Iowa. So how, how would you direct funding and what would be yeah. funding decisions? So that? one of the things that I've articulated uh, is that we need to do a much better job with rural health care, as you all know. You know, and I come from a state, Texas, where in the last couple of decades we'd had like 15 or 16 rural hospitals close, I think. You've seen several here in the last seven or eight years in Iowa that have either closed or closed their inpatient psychiatric care, OBGYN care, or other units of the hospital. So people have to travel farther and farther for decent health care. And if somebody is experiencing this kind of crisis in their life, then it's even more urgent that they be able to access those services um, near them. So I've called for greater investment in rural health care as we transition our health care system. You know, and you know, look, we're gonna we're fighting for a health care system that is based off of Medicare. Although I believe that if somebody has a very strong, solid health insurance, private health insurance program, that you know, I'm okay. 
having them hold on to that, but the default would be Medicare. We're going to fight for that very hard. But in either way, we should make sure that we improve access to health care for rural communities. Mental health care, also all of the things that we've talked about today, uh, so that people don't find themselves in the throes of um, a situation where they just keep spiraling downward. And we see the number of deaths that we've seen. So I know that we, we've talked a lot about the need to expand access. or a lack of financial access or an access to a healthcare facility, but it's the way in which the DEA has regulated those medications. And so Suboxone in particular is a mm -hmm. perfect medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder in rural communities. And that's because unlike methadone, you don't need to visit a clinic on a daily basis to take your methadone dose. Suboxone, someone can visit their provider once a month and uh, check in with them and take their prescription home, just like any other medication. However, that medication, in order to prescribe it, it requires uh, an X waiver attached to a physician's DEA license, mm -hmm. and that means that providers have to take additional training in order to prescribe that. So what is unique is that, so I'm a third year medical student in addition to this role, and so when I graduate from medical school, I will be able to write you a prescription for 100 Oxycontins, but I won't be able to write you a prescription for this medication that's such a crucial treatment. A number of providers around the country are calling for uh, what they call Xing the X waiver, so removing mm -hmm. this waiver completely. How would you support efforts to deregulate buprenorphine and methadone in order to make sure that everybody can get access to these treatments? Well, and I agree with, you know, I think the underlying that question is that, you know, we can do this in a way where we maintain safety for patients and integrity in the system and accountability, right, for those who are prescribing. So yes, I believe that we can do that without the cumbersome process that we have in place right now that requires this waiver. Um, because, you know, you make a good point, there are other prescriptions that are written uh, that don't require anything like that. Uh, and so I would support moving in that direction. Would you commit to getting rid of the X waiver? <laughs> so uh, I, I, I am open to that. Let me look, let me research it a little bit more since uh, today was the first day that I heard about that. Yeah. So I have generally avoided in this campaign committing to the, on the spot to things I have not fully you know read about. So, but I will I will take a look at it. Right. That's very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, transitioning a little bit from these medications and from treatment, we know that even though we need a massive of restructuring of healthcare access and that we need better access to treatment, probably um, the biggest issue at this point is just keeping people alive so that they yeah. can get treatment. Um, and so what we have seen, though, is that the federal government has made available an incredible amount of resources thus far, but not in quite enough to address the overdose crisis. Those resources have come to largely to the states to make decisions about yeah. how to spend the money, but not every state has the capacity in their state government to work with community to make those resource decisions. So for example, in a state like Iowa, um, we know that people who are on the ground who are most impacted, people who have used drugs, people who have worked with people that use drugs for decades, are not involved in these decisions about how to spend money. And so in Iowa, that translates to a scene, uh, largely a bunch of money put into repeated surveys, repeated needs assessments, mm. um, using federal dollars just to purchase naloxone that goes into the hands of police, which, well, that's important. They're statistically not as likely to administer the Narcan, whereas lay people like mothers, people that are friends with drug users are more likely to administer the Narcan. So my question is, um, as president, how would you fundamentally restructure the way in which federal agencies are assigned to distribute their funding to the states? And how would you instruct the states to work in collaboration with communities and with people who are directly impacted so that we don't see this continued tension between state governments essentially hoarding federal dollars and not putting mm -hmm. it where it's most effective? 
Well, as you know, we've had uh, legislation like the CARE Act that has been proposed that has different buckets of investments for state, local, tribal governments. I also am a fan of, and have been from the time that I was mayor, obviously coming from local government, and then HUD, um, when I had the opportunity to see a lot of the good work that nonprofits do, of working as much directly with service providers that are out there in the community, and not only empowering local governments, but also empowering those service providers. And so we would look for every opportunity that we can to make investments in nonprofits and similar organizations that are doing work within the community um, in a way that uh, you know, will measure through the effectiveness of their efforts. Right. And um, you know this, the issue that you're, you're bringing up of perhaps there's a different way to make sure that uh, this treatment actually gets to the people who need it, that maybe it's not working as well as, as legislators originally envisioned. Can we improve that? Well, one way to improve it might be to, to work more directly with uh, community organizations that are doing that work. And I'm open to that. You know, I'm, I'm open to adjusting the model of our investment, of our resource investment, so that it's actually getting to the people who need it. One thing that, you know, we've talked about treatment so much, we've been talking about harm reduction, um, we've talked about primary prevention, but we haven't talked about the fact of the matter that there are some people who may never quit using drugs, right? There are some people for whom treatment may not be their goal. Um, maybe it will be at some point, but for them in that time period, that isn't something that they want to seek. Um, and I want to tell you a personal story. Um, and so uh, in earlier this year, um, a person that worked in our program, um, who was also my partner, um, and someone that I plan to get married next July. We we're gonna go to Mexico and have this really beautiful wedding um, and invite a number of the people that are part of our community in this harm reduction mm -hmm. organization. Um, and Andy hurt his shoulder. So he slipped on the ice and he hurt his shoulder um, and he, um, he wasn't able to get prescription pain medication from the hospital because he is someone who was in recovery from an opioid addiction. He had used heroin for many years in the past. Um, and so he, um, in being in a lot of pain and not having an opportunity to solve it, he said, okay, I'm gonna go get some heroin. This is gonna help me with my pain. Um, and so he knew that that was something that was risky for him, um, but it's a, a choice that he made unfortunately, but for better or for worse, just to deal with his pain. And that's because, right, no human wants to be in pain. People sure. can put up with a lot of pain, but at some point it gets to be too much. Um, and so Andy was someone who, who knew the dangers of using opioids. And so a number of times um, when he was traveling, especially out of the country in places where safe injection facilities uh, or safe consumption spaces exist, he would go and seek out those spaces, right? And so those are spaces in which um, if you go to them and you're using, someone can Narcan you. They can administer the drug uh, just in case you overdose. Um, and so Andy was a really firm believer in those programs. Um, but because we don't have them in places in yeah. the United States, um, he one morning when I was at work, um, he was at home and I was using some heroin by himself just a few days after this accident had happened. Um, and he overdosed and he died. Um, and so knowing that for so many people like him, um, that they would still be alive if they were able to use a place like a safe consumption space. Um, how would you instruct the Department of Justice as president to pursue um, the work that they do with those spaces? Right now yeah. we know that um, there's a, a current lawsuit between a space in Philadelphia called Safe yeah. House, right? Yeah. So how would you instruct them to pursue this issue? Well, I would like these communities to be able to um, pursue these safe consumption spaces and essentially pilot out how they work. You know, I believe that that we owe it to the effort to see how we can make sure that we avoid these kinds of tragic circumstances. I, you know, I'm very sorry to hear what happened to Andy. And, you know, um, we've been trying it one way for so long. Uh, and I also believe, having been a mayor of a city, 
that one of the values of local communities is that they can, um, you know, try out policy in their own community and measure the results and see um, how it works, right? Because the system that we have in place right now doesn't seem to be working very much at all. Uh, and so when it comes, whether it's Philadelphia or it's some of the other cities that have tried it, you know, I believe that we should allow for the piloting of these programs uh, and that that will help us come to a determination nationally about the approach. We have touched on so many different topics today. What else do you think it's really important that you want us to know and for folks watching on the live stream to know about your plan to address this crisis? Uh, what I would say is um, that throughout the campaign that I hope folks have been following because we've been kind of marching to the beat of our own drummer and speaking up for people that are often the most forgotten and the most marginalized, the most vulnerable. And you know, I guess I would like to say to, to, that in this country, we've just gone through three years of a president who tries to scapegoat and otherize and look down on people who are not like him. And I want a country where everyone counts, a country that doesn't reflect hate but reflects love and compassion and reflects basic understanding that people's lives don't always work out the way we think their lives should work out or even as they thought they were going to work out and that we need to meet those moments in their lives with compassion and with the resources that they need to get on the kind of path that they want to get on and not just casting them aside or criminalizing them, otherizing them. And that's the spirit and the perspective that I would bring to this work and that my administration would bring to this work if I'm elected president. Um, and I want to thank you all very much for having me and even more for the work that you all are doing on a daily basis to make sure that people um, who need help get the help that they need and who are every bit as deserving to be able to live their life are able to do that. Thank you so much. And thank you all. We really are grateful to you for coming and being a part of this space. It is unusual for a person running for president to come and visit our harm reduction organization. Mm -hmm. And so we are really grateful to you for making time during your campaign to visit us um, and to learn more about the work that we're doing here. So thank you for the work that you're doing and for the way you're prioritizing our people and people who use drugs in your campaign. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks so thank much. you. Do we have time for questions from audience? We have a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. First of all, I'm so glad that there is media coverage here because I believe that we should get a chance to choose who we want for president at caucus and not because the media has blocked out candidates. And you are doing an excellent job. Yeah. And, Thank you. Um, as I knew you would, because it's not luck and certainty. I never dreamt you were going to do this, though, today. Um, as you know, I'm a teamster, yeah. but I'm also a black guy. And I didn't know that there was profiling in the ER. Hmm. And it's not necessarily racial profiling, but it's a mental profile. And then the racial goes into it. I was prescribed Concerta by my doctor, mm -hmm. and it was extended tag, and it mm -hmm. was a patch. It ran my blood pressure up to 285 mm. over 104 mm. for seven consecutive days. Could not open my eyes. The room was spinning. I was bleeding from my ears. Mm. To fix me, all they had to do was give me a nitroglycerin tablet. If I had been a white woman over 50, they would have given it to me. But because I was an African-American male between the ages of 45 and 39, and when they tested my system, there were amphetamines in my system, mm. which was methamphetamine salts from Adderall, which I told them that was what had happened. And I 
I showed them my prescription, they said, we understand that. However, the law is that if methamphetamines are in your system, and with you also being African American in these parameters, even if you have a prescription, we cannot help you. Hmm. I said, what can you do? I said, you can pray. I said, well, what can happen to me? They said, well, your blood pressure can probably burst the capillaries in your uh, major organs and you're going to renal failure. Basically, by the end of the week, one way or the other, either your blood pressure will go down or we will have our answer what's going to happen. Hmm. And I said, why? They said, it's the law. And I said, it's the law that I have to die. Hmm. They said, well, don't worry about that now. It'll just elevate your blood pressure. I got through it. Um, ended up doing an old Mexican remedy, which was garlic water, which brought my blood pressure down. <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. But the thing about it is the law was not on my side yet once again. So if the police officer doesn't kill me on a routine traffic stop, I could die like Dr. Drew Hale died, who created the whole blood plasma thing. Mm -hmm. And he died by bleeding out because he wasn't near a, a, a black hospital. I could die going to the ER because the law is not on my side because I, I have attention deficit disorder and I'm black. Yeah. And so there's all this double stigma, you know? And it was really hard for me to go outside of my culture and go and get the help that I knew that I needed scholastically in 91. So I've been taking either Adderall, Concerta, Ritalin. I've been taking some form of that since 1991. Wow. The law is not for me. Yeah. No, I was just say, I mean, first of all, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing that, your story. And um, I'm happy that you're here with us and that you did make it through that um, because, you know, uh, I think your story is far too typical of the experience of too many people in our country and um, both in your case you know maybe a law that doesn't doesn't work well with some people's individual circumstances and also of course we know also in our healthcare system that too often times that your skin color unfortunately even in the year 2019 still determines the quality of care that you get and the how much you're listened to and the decisions that are made by healthcare providers. And it's in the DSM V4. They actually canonized it in a book. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we need to change about our healthcare system. And, you know, we need to find ways to both incentivize healthcare providers to do better uh, and also to penalize ones that don't do better, that don't take steps to um, uh, equalize. The treatment of people across racial lines and ethnic lines. Yeah. And on top of that, I think the conversation that we've had today about taking a different approach toward making sure that people get the health care that they need and that we don't just impose these rigid approaches on patients, you know, I think that that makes sense. Uh, I look forward um, to having uh, a health and human services uh, and Department of Justice work group on how we can better align our approach so that we don't just crack down or don't just put, you know, support laws that don't further people's health care and don't really get us closer to solving the challenge, but end up hurting people instead. So you wouldn't put like a surgeon over HUD or uh, put like uh, elementary school teacher over medicine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Certain terms. We, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's right. I, I, we will appoint, we will actually appoint great people, not like this president that uh, said he was and has not. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? 
with that, I think I'd like to thank our sponsors again. So just to recognize uh, AIDS United, the Drug Policy Alliance, and the Harm Reduction Coalition, mm -hmm. which have been participating with us in this series of conversations with different candidates. Um, and again, just once more, thank you for being here and being in our office. And thanks to your campaign staff as well for sure. all the work that you're doing to organize folks in community around the state. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and conclude. And thank you to those folks who've been watching on the live stream. All right, hey, yeah, good to see you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank yes. you very much. And thank you for all the work y'all are doing. You have one, one year left in medical school? I think so. <laughs> <laughs>